Thank you all so much for joining us for the Trap Cash Bail in America Live Town Hall. We are honored to be together today to celebrate the official launch of the National Social Impact Campaign for the YouTube original series film Trapped Cash Bail in America, a compelling new film that takes a close look at the controversial bail cash bail system in the United States how people are adversely affected by its implementation and the ongoing grassroots efforts to combat its negative consequences and to reform the system. My name is Topeka K. Sam and I'm the founder and executive director of the Ladies of Hope Ministries. Our vision is epic and that's to end poverty and incarceration of women and girls. What we do know is by ending mass incarceration, ending any of the impacts of the criminal legal system, pretrial, in the system post-incarceration, we must address the root issues, which are poverty. And so poverty in this film is so timely because this is what we're talking about. And it's my pleasure to moderate today's panel on behalf of Odyssey Impact. If you're wondering who's Odyssey Impact, Odyssey is a Peabody Award-winning social impact organization that is leading the national social impact campaign for trapped cash bail in America which will highlight the complex and multifaceted ways in which cash bail fundamentally punishes individuals, upends families, and destabilizes minority communities, all without a guilty verdict. Today's conversation will focus on the economic and racial inequities and inequalities of the cash bail system, emerging reform efforts, the opposition polls by the bail industry, and how the 2020 election will shape the future of the American criminal legal system. Odyssey Impact is proud to bring programming like today's town hall in collaboration with our partners. It is with the support of our friends like you that we can contribute and continue our mission to drive social change through innovative storytelling and media. We are delighted to co-present this town hall with our valued campaign partner, the Ending Mass Incarceration Initiative. And with the increased urgency around this issue, we are honored to have their partnership along with our esteemed panelists who are all working to bring greater awareness of the injustice of the cash bail system. We will now ask each panelist to say a quick hello and their biographies will be shared in the chat to provide additional background information. Chris Jenkins, producer and writer, Trapped Cash Bail in America. Thanks for joining everyone. I really appreciate uh, folks who've watched the film and are participating today in the town hall. Thank you, Chris. William Evans, founder and president, Neighborhood Benches. Hello, how you doing? I'm here, I'm here with you. Thank you, William. Robin Steinberg, founder and CEO, The Bail Project. Hi, good afternoon. Looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Robin. Pastor Robert Turner, Pastor Historic Vernon AME Church. Good afternoon, everyone. So glad to be in your midst. Thank you, Pastor Turner. And Brittany White, Live Free Decarceration Manager, Faith in Action. Hey, everybody. Excited to bring the perspective of a faith leader, formerly incarcerated woman, and community organizer. Thank you so, so much, Brittany. And love your t-shirt. A special introduction for Allison Shin, Senior Planner, Closing Mass Incarceration's Front Door, Vera Institute of Justice. As today's chat moderator, Allison, would you like to share more about your role? Sure, thanks Topeka. Um, as chat moderator, I want to direct you to the chat button on your Zoom interface. Feel free to get started now by typing hello to everyone from wherever you may be joining us today. And as this town hall proceeds, add your comments, thoughts, and questions. I'll be closely following the chat to answer questions and share background information on the issue of cash bail. We want this to be as interactive an experience as possible. So please be aware that when you post a chat item, you can choose all panelists or you can choose all panelists and all attendees. We encourage you to share with everyone by choosing all panelists and all attendees. I'll be back to share some audience questions with our panelists later in the town hall. In the meantime, I look forward to speaking with you all in the chat. Thank you so much, Allison. And we look forward to all the questions that have come from there or comments. And so let's just get started. We don't have a lot of time today. So the first question is gonna to go to Chris. 
Can you share with us what compelled you to tell this story, especially as a filmmaker of color, and why you chose to pursue a social impact campaign for the film? So thanks for the question. And again, thanks for, for having me and thanks for everyone for joining. Um, I think the incidents of the film really are like most documentaries. It started with a conversation I had um, and what turned out to be an infuriating conversation and actually happened to be a conversation I had with our panelist, William Evans, who also happens to be uh, one of the main characters in the film. And about three and a half years ago, we were sitting on a bench in the Bronx and he was telling me a little bit about what he experienced when he was at Rikers Island. Um, 11 months not being able to pay his bail, wound up uh, fighting his charge and becoming and being um, and beating his case. And what I couldn't get my mind around was the fact that if, the, if he had had enough money to get out of jail and pay his bail, he would have been released. He was not in jail because the court had decided that he was either a flight risk, that he wasn't going to come back to court or that he was some sort of danger to, the, to society when he was out on bail. The only reason was that he couldn't pay his bail. And for someone who has sort of followed criminal justice for a long time, who considers himself somewhat of a, you know, woke person who knows what's going on in the world, it actually never clicked in my head that this was, that this was actually a, a incredible injustice, that the only reason why he was in jail is because he couldn't pay. And that if he was able to pay, he would have been able to be free and continue with his life as he fought his case. And then as Garrett Hubbard, our director, and I sort of dug into this and talked with uh, YouTube originals who uh, broadcast, who's currently streaming the film, we realized that there were so many people who happen, this happens to every day. Um, whether they're black or white or Latino or Asian, it all has to do with you know how much money people have in their bank account. And the issue here is for those who think, well, he's a criminal and he should be in jail anyway. It's like, well, no, he's not a criminal. He's not been found guilty. Um, as the court found, he was found not guilty. He did, actually did not commit the crime that he was accused of. And so this is an innocent person who spent nearly a year in jail in one of the worst jails in the country, um, essentially being punished for the accusation. And as a filmmaker of color, when you start to look at it, you know that, you know, what most things in criminal justice disproportionately um, affect black, black and brown communities. Um, as someone who grew up in Harlem and grew up in New York in the 80s and saw um, our communities be racked with, with criminal justice issues, um, it became apparent that this was a story that, although it had been talked about in various news articles and there have been a couple of short documentaries, there had never really been a documentary that spent time with people. Um, and, and as they go through um, the, the issues of being caught or what happens to the family when they're caught in the situation, not being able to pay their bail while and, and, and only being in jail because they couldn't pay. And so we thought it was a perfect time a couple of years ago to do this uh, doc. And um, we just learned more and more about how the system is so unweighted um, uh, and so unfair to uh, people of color and to poor people. Um, and that's the bottom line here is that we are criminalizing poverty in a way every day at the, to the tune of 500,000 people every day who are in jail because of the circumstance. So that's how we got here, um, reducing the film and wanting to then go ahead and you know, try to amplify the film through this social, social impact campaign. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I remember when I was incarcerated um, in the county jail, actually before I was sentenced, and to your point, it was black and white women, just all poor there many whom have been there even close to a year because they couldn't even pay a hundred dollars. And I couldn't imagine, you know, how a person would feel, first of all, if they're there, why are they being criminalized and being sentenced to a hundred because the judge knew, right, that they couldn't get out. So they kept them there for that amount of money. But the cost that it actually would take to have them there, it was just atrocious on top of all the other fees that people have to pay in different jails, even staying or, you know, in a prison living in a prison daily. Sometimes there are daily fees, there are medical fees, and there are other fees. And I remember having some of my friends actually pay bails just so people can get out and go home to women, specifically to their children. And so the title of the film is Trapped. William and Brian, why and how are people impacted by the cash bail system trapped? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so there are, there are multiple ways that, um, that we are impacted by um, this cash bail system, when you look at when you look at the amount of time spent inside and everything that you, that that you will be missing out on, um, for me being a father, being a college student, 
um, contributing to my community, like all of all of those things was taken away um, just because I couldn't afford this bill. But there's also another side of the story where the things that you're actually going through while you're inside, um, the way the correction officers um, treat you, the ride from Rikers Island to the courthouse, um, how early in the morning you got to get up. Um, and sometimes if you don't get up, you can't eat breakfast, you can't go outside. So there's a numerous of things that take place while you're inside that a lot of people have no idea. So when you're talking about Bell and you're thinking about Bell and every day you have to repeat these same type of things all over again. Um, I remember um, I remember being inside and just having to William, why you jump, why you get your sound together? I think Topeka was the question addressed to me as well. Um, um, there you go. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, just, the, just the number of things that, that I go, that I went through while I was inside, um, just having to report officers for um, not allowing us to use the shower or the lunch or the lobby. Um, and things like that. Um, those are things that I had to go through on an everyday basis. Um, and, and those are stories that people are not hearing. So when we're talking about bail and we want to um, post bail and get out so we can return to the community and the family, like those things tear just rip away at you day by day. Um, you know, for a black man growing up in a community that's already oppressed, that's going through so much, you know, not only is it a lot of money, like that money can pay a year rent, you know, um, for the amount of bail that they had me under. Um, so I'm just one of millions of stories out there. Absolutely. And Brittany, if you can share from a woman's perspective on what that's like. Absolutely. I think one of the reasons why we say trapped is because I, I caught my charge when I had just turned 23. And you just don't know what you don't know about the legal system until you're vulnerable to be taken advantage of. So I was very unaware of what my rights were. I was very unaware of what I needed to be advocating for and communicating to my folks. So I was arrested and my initial bond was no bond. Then that's because the judge who was going to be presiding over my case was on vacation. So they thought it was suffice for me to sit there until he came back. When he came back, he gave me a $250,000 bond as a woman with no prior history for trafficking marijuana in the state of Alabama. So for six weeks, my family and my support system at the time went and hired an, uh, an attorney from the neighboring large city. Well, that was one of my mistakes that I didn't know is that he was not in the brother-in-law fraternity of that local municipality. So they were very offended that I, somebody who wasn't from Alabama, went to the big city to go get an attorney to tell them what to do. So these were all grave mistakes that I made at the time. It took me six weeks to advocate with a paid attorney. And it's important to say a paid attorney, not to be snooty, or say that there's anything wrong with public defenders, but there is, it is understood that when you pay for a service with legal, with a legal paid attorney, that you should get a certain quality of representation. The quality I was able to get was $91,000 to bond out on, and my parents had to put their property up in order to enforce that bond since I was not from Alabama. Later, when I was released, it turned out that that company, the bail bonds company never took the lien off of my parents' house. And so we had to go through an extensive process to get that corrected. So I think what we mean by trapped is it's very easy to get entangled in the legal system and it's very difficult to come out unscathed. That's right, thank you. That was such a brilliant way of saying that. Um, I was watching yesterday a documentary time movie and it was the same thing, you know, you can come, it's so easy to get in and so hard to get out. Um, and Robin, you know, how does this result in a two-tiered system of justice for those with and without economic means? 
Yeah, it's actually really straightforward. And in that way, I think it's shocking. Uh, the American cash bail system literally puts a price on one of our most basic legal protections, which is the presumption of innocence. And it turns out that that fundamental right, in, it turns it into a luxury that only people with money can afford. So today in America, two people charged with the exact same offense will receive entirely different treatment and access to justice depending on whether or not they had enough money to bail out. Um, cash bail reduces a person's freedom to a dollar amount. So if you can't pay the cash, you stay in jail until your case goes to trial. And if you can pay the cash, no matter what you're charged with, you get to go home to safety, back to your family, to your community, to your job, to your kids. It is literally a wealth-based incarceration. Uh, we say we don't lock people up for poverty in this country. We say we don't have a debtor's prison in this country, but in reality, that is exactly what we have. And cash bail is a driver of that. Um, it's important to remember though, I think that cash bail is one piece of the larger system um, from policing to bail setting to sentencing to probation and parole, we know that the system doesn't operate fairly. We know that there's a two-tier system of justice, not just in the cash bail context, but in every aspect of our criminal legal system. Communities of color and low-income communities across this country have historically been the target of America's criminal legal system at every single turn. Uh, from policing, where black and brown communities are surveilled and policed and arrested for conduct that we know is going on in every community, but it's only being policed in theirs, to the setting of cash bail, which if you're black or brown, it is more likely it's going to be a higher bail than your white counterpart, which in turn makes it more likely you're going to plead guilty because you have to go home, it's the only way to go home, to conviction rates. And we know that those conviction rates then heap fines and fees on you and your family, further driving you into poverty, and it will create obstacles in employment and housing and education and benefits for the rest of your life. Sentencing is longer if you're black or brown or from a marginalized community. So the entire system, well, cash bail is one piece of it and a critical thread to pull apart, right? The entire system conspires not just to keep poor folks in poverty, but it also embeds and perpetuates systemic racism from the beginning of the system to the end. And cash bail is just one piece, very important piece indeed, but of that larger system. That's right. And I was watching the, um, the film and they talked about the Eighth Amendment and the fact that, you know, when you think about how the connection between the Eighth Amendment and the Thirteenth Amendment, and I don't want to say much about it. I, everyone needs to watch this film. But they just talked about how bail should not be excessive. And we know that that's not true. I mean, even having no bail is considered excessive bail. And so, you know, just thinking about those of us who have maybe, like myself, had a categorized nonviolent crime, yet I had a no bail. Um, at all. People say that cash bail reform often, they'll argue that ending the system will per or permit the release of categorized people, quote, who are violent, who have violent crimes back into the community. Um, many advocates, even like myself, you know, believe that that is bogus and, you know, an idea that it's just as my brother Khalil Cumberbatch always says, you know, it's fear mongering. Um, but how would you respond to this argument? And how do you think alternatives to cash bail systems promote public safety and protect the rights of defendants who are, again, innocent until proven guilty? Yeah, sure. It's a great question. And I, I think it bears repeating, right, that we're still talking about a moment where someone's been charged with a crime but not yet convicted. Um, and we know from the data that, that we've been keeping at the Bail Project over the past few years that when cash bail gets paid for somebody in our context, up to 50% of the cases that people are charged with get dismissed. So the notion that people lock, first, the notion that people locked up in bail bondage are violent criminals is just a narrative of fear. Um, I agree with you. It's the narrative of fear that's been perpetuated for generations to justify what we do to people, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that bad things are never going to happen, um, but it's really important to remember that those instances are going to be the rare exception, not the rule. Um, so we have to stop legislating and thinking about this issue around the exception and ground ourselves in what usually happens and in the reality of actually what's happened. Um, it, you know, rather than focusing on the unknowable and the rare exception, we need to focus on the evidence of the real harm, the real violence, and the real damage that happens to the millions of people every year who we lock up who haven't been convicted of a crime simply because they don't have enough money to pay their bail. When I think about, and I think reformers think about imagining a better system, um, you know, there are some principles that we need to adhere to, right? The presumption should always be released. Um, incarceration before conviction should only be limited to the very, very rare exception. It should always be a last resort. 
Um, and if the rare exception is going to be used, then the burden should always, always rest with government to prove why someone must be detained before conviction. Because like I said, everything should be grounded in the presumption that people can be released. Um, I think there have to be strong procedural protections put in place for the accused before that finding can, can uh, be had. Um, and the accused has to have counsel, can present evidence, can cross-examine witnesses to have a real hearing in a real transparent way. Um, and we should never build a new system on algorithmic risk assessment tools. Um, we should be very, very vigilant so we don't recreate a system um, with onerous conditions for people who are being released once they're free because they haven't yet been convicted. And I think the, the bigger issue when we think about this in terms of reform, you know, we have to think about whatever system we create has to shift our thinking entirely, right? From isolation and punishment, right? To really thinking about collaboration and need. What does this person need in order to be successful and come back to court? What services can we connect them to during this period of time from arrest to the case end? Um, are we addressing those unmet needs that might be driving people into the system and have contact with it in the first place? And we're only gonna begin to do that if we divest in jails and if we stop looking at incarceration as the solution to everything and begin to really invest in low-income communities and communities of color um, and that have been under-resourced for generations. And I think when we do that, we might get to some real positive reform efforts. Thank you so much for that, Robin. I was looking for my little brown hands with the claps, but I couldn't find <laughs> my reaction. So that's why I got a little delayed. Sorry, everyone. But I just want to take a moment uh, to bring in Pastor Turner into the conversation. So I know we haven't had an opportunity to hear from you yet. Um, so I'm going to shift a little bit from you know what we were doing to something a little different. Um, one of the most moving scenes in the film is the Mother's Day bailout. We have seen community groups throughout the country do similar initiatives. Earlier this year, the historic Vernon A&E Church hosted a cash bail workshop. Pastor Turner, can you tell us about the event and the current need in the community? Yes, thank you all again, um, Odyssey Impact. This is wonderful. Uh, Nita, Chris, brother, Mr. Jenkins, outstanding job on the documentary. Um, really, really, really was very moved by it. Um, what we did at Vernon, um, partnering with the local community group, uh, Block Builders, uh, we had a cash bailout uh, forum um, where we allowed for people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system, one of them recently released from prison, um, Cora Atkinson, who one of my members who was a judge, uh, looked back at the evidence of his case and found the district attorney was overzealous in prosecuting him and she released him from prison. Right, he was been, his, he, this man has been in prison for 28 years um, and he didn't commit the crime, you know, uh, which is, he lost the best years of his life being incarcerated. And so we heard from people such as him and others on just how deplorable uh, Oklahoma's bail system is. And Oklahoma is one of, is known as being one of the highest incarcerated states in the country per capita. Um, and to, to me, this is, a moral issue, um, and that's why we want to be involved in it. Every major prophet uh, in the Bible, pretty much, um, uh, was has been arrested. You know, from the three Hebrew boys uh, to even in the New Testament with Paul, uh, Jesus, John the Baptist were all incarcerated. Right, uh, are, are suffered in the criminal justice system, and they were not allowed to bail out. You know, so Christians really should take this. Christians, Jews, Abraham traditions. Uh, should take this as a moral fight um, because it is truly a deplorable. Um, and our current uh, jail system in every place I've ever lived is like a third world. You know, the conditions that we put people in, they haven't even been convicted. I think in the film, uh, Mr. Jenkins produced a documentary, it stated 76% of the people who are in jail in America are pre-trial meaning they've never been convicted of a crime. That's terrible, right? So you have innocent people locked up in prison. And so it, it is, it, it, that's, that's a sad fact in and of itself. But then you add on to that, our jails are no place nice, right? Uh, we treat animals better than we treat human beings. Think I'm lying? Go to an animal shelter. In an animal shelter, you will see each animal, each dog has his or her own kennel. They have their own water bottle. When you go to a jail, they just pack people in one kennel. Basically, we treat animals 
better than we treat human beings. They were the 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 human the, the animal rights community would, would 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 file a lawsuit against every county jail in the nation if they house if they house animals like they house human beings. You you put three pit bulls in the same kennel, you're gonna have a lawsuit on your hands. You put you put four Rottweilers in the same kennel at an animal shelter, you're gonna have a lawsuit on your hands. But you put twelve black men in the same jail room, no problem. Not none of us people don't care. You put you put you put 12 black women in the same jail or white women or whomever, whoever is incarcerated, you're gonna have, you're gonna have no problem from the animal rights group, but no problem from people who care about life. That they don't care about the lives, the, the lives of poor, the lives of black, the lives of brown people, as much as they care about the lives of animals. And that's a sad problem. And I'm and I, I'm an animal lover. But if we if but if if single kennels are good enough for animals, they ought to be good enough for human beings. That is such a powerful point, uh, Pastor. And you know, just to piggyback off of that, and I think it's a good place to go about racial justice issues. Why is cash bail a racial justice issue? And William, how does over policing of minority communities influence the system? So I take my community in the South Bronx, right? Um, whether you're going to the store for for a newspaper in the morning or going to take your lunch in the afternoon, you will see tens of cars passing passing through the neighborhood, as well as as well as about fifteen to twenty officers on one neighborhood block, right? Just patrolling the area, right? These are not officers who are regularly engaging with community on a positive note. These are not officers who are saying hello to community members, let alone not even officers who come from the community, right? So how do you expect people to, to act when these strangers are in a neighborhood and they are there not to do any good, right? Um, you will see the same thing in school systems and all of this, right? But when you think about when an officer arrests you, right? Just for a simple thing as kids fighting, right? I come up in an era where we can break that fight up, have them shake hands, take them home, right? And the parents will talk it out. The parents will get together and talk about it, right? That's not happening because a police officer arrests the child, take the child to the precinct, then they have a criminal record, right? That's a small example of how our communities are over criminalized, right? And my work in our work, what we're doing in communities is bringing families together, bringing kids together and having them talk talk about it, right? So that can no longer happen again. And when you look at the, the um, data, when you're, when you're looking at things like, like that, where you're mediating situations, that no longer happened. That happens to be the best friend later on in life, right? But having offices just in communities and then the relationship they have with prosecutors and the prosecutors are taking their sides. Like these are things that may not seem normal to you, but it's normal to us because it's happening all, all, all of the, the dumb time, you know, um, but these are things that you would never hear anyone talking about. But so when you're thinking about just criminalization of our community, it's not only the uh, officers, it's, it's the relationship between the officers, the prosecutors and the judges. Absolutely. And one of the major topics of popular discussion right now is the allocation of public resources and where more funds should be spent on social services, education, healthcare, and other programs rather than policing. Brittany, can you explain how these discussions could impact the cash bail system? Yes, Topeka, and I really just want to applaud you for how you worded this question because the narrative has been part of the fight. I think it's two facets of this conversation is the narrative and the resources. The narrative has been lost because this question has been framed as defunding the police. I don't think that's necessarily the most helpful way to frame the question. The part that I wanna focus on is 
funding wellness and dignity for historically underserved communities. And we know what parts of those, what parts of this conversation, people need reliable transportation. They need a flourishing education system. They need access to healthy food. They need a livable wage. They need access to affordable health care. They need safe and secure housing and they need a pathway to dignity. So in any county or city, the police is the largest line item on any budget. And what we're saying that is if my mother used to tell me when we asked to go to McDonald's Topeka, you don't have no McDonald's money. And I'm saying to these cities and these counties, you don't have any more money to keep policing underserved communities unless you have serviced them unless they are flourishing in those areas that I laid out, then we can go to them and ask them to be accountable for their behavior. But when people only have one tool left in their toolbox and that is aggression, we in our animalistic nature are, are designed and programmed to survive. So if I have tried to navigate the system and advocate for my well-being, and all my resources have been extracted, then I'm going then I'm to go to, to the one thing, one thing that I have, that left, I have left, and that is resource. That is aggression. And so, in order to curve people from having to resort to the very animalistic nature that lives within them, we have to equip them with resources, and we have a government responsibility to do that. We also have to centralize those resources so people can find them. So many times we talk to decision makers, and they want to brag about their programs. I'm like, that's dope. We need more of that. How can we get you more resources? But who knows it's happening it's besides your cousins and the people in your personal network? How are we putting this information on platform so people who are on that intersection of gun violence and decarceration are able to find these resources? I'm looking for my brown hands again, but <laughs> I mean, you hit so many points. And I think because you do so much work as they say on the ground, you know exactly what it is that the community needs. And so thank you for all those powerful points, um, uh, especially around the, the narrative or you know, the thought of defunding the police, but re, or rather reinvesting into, into the communities. And so beyond bailouts, what would we say are other calls of action that can in, enact change? And please also look at the chat Allison is putting some really great information in there as well. So Brittany, William, Robin, any of you, where are other calls of action that can enact change? I'm happy to kick us off, y'all. So the first thing we can do is vote down your ballot. So many people, we encourage folks to vote in presidential elections, but you don't know you need a district attorney until you, until you see the state versus your name. And you had an opportunity to have an opinion about who is sitting in that seat. So do some research. Don't just vote down the ballot, but be an informed voter. The second thing I'll say is in our personal network, we a lot of us have snuck up to that county jail to get one of our relatives. So we have people within our own family who had experiences with incarceration. Have a conversation with them. What resources and support do they need? Are they... Acute, are they um, acclimating back to society well, or are there ways that you could support them? Do they need a recommendation letter from somebody in your personal network to be able to make their application stand up and get that job? The last thing I will say is some of you are just like, I want to give my money. How can I give my money to a meaningful organization? And I'm going to suggest that you give your money to one of my mentors. Pilar Weiss runs this organization. She's a phenomenal woman with the abolitionist framework, the Community Justice Exchange. And I will drop that link for you in the chat. And also talk. I don't know if y'all having Thanksgiving dinner this year, but if you and your cousins just get on a Zoom and eat turkey sandwiches, talk about this subject. We have to have a change of hearts and minds in this country of how we view people who have encountered the criminal justice system. So begin to affect the culture with good messaging and talk about it. I don't know who wants to go after Brittany, but 
I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> just to, just to, just, just, to con, con, just to continue that, just to continue that thought, Topeka. You know, one of the women who, one of the people in the film that people have really responded to is Mary Hooks, who uh, runs uh, uh, Southerners on New Ground uh, in Atlanta. And I hope it was apparent to the film about the kind of daily work that is going into unwinding the bail system in particular, and she works on a whole bunch of things uh, in Atlanta and across the South. But the meticulous work, everyday work to go to those city council members, going to the state legislature, um, it's not, you know, sort of easy, just write it. I mean, writing a check's important and would never suggest anyone not do that, uh, but supporting people like her in any way you can. Uh, and there are, there are women and men across the country who are doing sorts of things, but just because she's, you know, she made it to our film and she's such a powerful uh, person. I mean, the, the yes, daily, I, hope it was, I thought, the, I hope it came up, the daily work that she's doing, um, you know, showing up again, like I said, city council meetings and that sort of thing. That's what it takes, you know, along the line. And then of course there's Alec Caracatansis, who is the attorney who is, you know, found a framework uh, to challenge bail um, on constitutional lines. Um, and, you know, so like he says in the film, I mean, you need sort of, you know, the civil rights and progressive minded attorneys um, to uh, hit bail at the highest regions of our society, which is the courts. Uh, but then, you know, at, you know, at a different level, at a grassroots level, like women like Mary. And so, you know, in terms of movement, it's, it's a difficult issue to have a singular movement around because bail is often legislated at local levels and, um, you know, city council um, decisions and state legislatures. And so uh, and in individual cities and states and counties and jurisdictions. So it's a real, it's a bear to get your arms around, but you know, there is something going on in your community. I can be rest assured wherever you are. Um, and I think that's what certainly what Brittany would advocate for, I'm sure, and what Robin is doing every day, um, what William is doing in his community. So there are so many ways to get involved in trying to address this issue from a myriad of ways. Thank you, Robin. I it's hard to add to any of that. Everybody sort of said, I think what really needs to be said, um, other than just to, you know, I just to close it out. It's right. It's like every big problem that we try to tackle, you're going to have to have all different strategies working together. There's not going to be one answer. So whether it's voting for progressive prosecutors or judges, grassroots organizing, court watch programs that are holding system actors accountable, whether it's art or music or poetry, all of those strategies, legal strategies, they all have to be working together um, to get us where we need to be. And I think that's really the point of this, which is that, you know, find the strategy that speaks to you and get involved. Um, and certainly, and I completely agree with Brittany, be educated about who you are electing at every single level and what their positions are in the criminal legal system and cash bail um, and make sure that you, you know, know who you're voting for and that they reflect the values that you want to see. That's right. And Allison is also uh, going to share some additional information around pre-child pre detention on minority communities, public health outcomes, um, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and alternatives to cash bail. And so Pastor Turner, how can faith be used as a tool to advocate for people trapped in the cash bail system? And how can the religious concept of redemption be helpful in this advocacy? Thank you for asking. And if I would also, if I can add on to the to answering the last one, um, not only electing people that are sensible, but after they get elected, holding them accountable, right? So what we do November the 4th, to me, is, is just as important. Um, we have to follow through. Uh, I think sometimes too often, we feel that we are done just by voting and voting is one act of civic participation. Um, but guess what? These courthouses are open every day, taking cases, and they don't charge to come in. If you're willing to go through a metal detector, you can you, you can literally sit in a courtroom all day and observe the proceedings, right? And, and we used to have things called court watchers. We have poll watchers for elections. We ought to have more court watchers, people that are not there for a crime, but just are there observing the proceedings. Um, and because when people know that the community is not paying attention and the only time we pay attention is maybe on election day, but when they go into these courtrooms, they say and do whatever, they give out sentences, um, they do it. And, and I think that we need to do a better job and not just going to the courthouses, but going to city council meetings, school board meetings, all these public meetings 
that you don't have to pay to go to. And you can actually go and see what is going on in the community uh, that you live in. Um, so just kudos on everything else people have been saying, but I just wanted to add that, you know, after the election, that's really when the real work begins in our democracy. Um, in order for it to work, our founding fathers didn't just want us to have a limited participation in civics at just the election box. Um, they left all of our meetings open publicly for us to go participate. And so what does faith um, teach us about this issue and how does it inspire? Um, as I think I mentioned earlier, how we, every major uh, person of note in the Bible, in Abrahamic religions, period, um, served a lot of time in jail. I mean, a lot of time in jail, a lot of them died, uh, capital punishment deaths. Uh, John the Baptist was beheaded. Uh, Jesus Christ was crucified. Apostle Paul was crucified. Um, Peter crucified. I mean, they, they tried to kill John, uh, the, 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 I mean, the uh, revelator. They tried to boil him in oil and they tried to do everything, but they just thought John couldn't die, you know. But so it is, it, it is something that it is ingrained. This, this, this persecution of the early church before we got in our big cathedrals and before we start having altar boys and, and armor bearers and before we start wearing five piece suits and top hats, we were fleeing for our lives, right? And, and now that we kind of got the Cadillacs and the Stacey Adams, you know, we've kind of become a little bit more comfortable than the early prophets that went before us. And I think that we also lost touch with those who are incarcerated. Jesus mentioned, right? He didn't just say those that are thirsty that you give me water or those that are hungry you gave me food. He said, when I was in prison, did you come visit me? You know, he, he specified those as people that he identifies with. He said, that which you did not do unto the least of these, you didn't do unto me. So of all the categories of people Jesus could have included, he mentioned the poor, he mentioned the thirsty, he mentioned the hungry, he mentioned the naked, he mentioned the homeless, and he also mentioned the incarcerated. So that lets us know if Jesus is in prison, then everybody in jail ain't guilty. But he knew that <laughs> right. people, would, innocent people, would always be incarcerated in a corrupt world. So we don't need to neglect those people. And in fact, we need to visit them. And that visiting them is more than just going to sit behind a glass window. It's seeing about them. It's seeing about what issues are important to them, what they are dealing with, what, what they are suffering from, how we treat animals in this country better than we do our incarcerated. And we wonder why our incarcerated leave acting like animals sometimes. Because you treat people like animals. And I'm amazed and I'm thankful that we have the civility we have in prisons because we sure treat them uncivilly. And I'm thankful that anytime I see somebody, I have a first cousin right now, God bless him. And he communicates, man. I hope I'm not getting him in trouble. Um, they are not treating prisoners right. And I'm amazed anytime people who are mistreated so much can, remain, can, contain, can retain their civility. I was amazed during the civil rights movement when Martin Luther King and those folk were, were treated uncivilly, yet they remain civil. And for those folk who've been incarcerated and treated like animals, but yet they still keep their civility. My hat goes off to people like Brittany and William because I don't know how you did it, but you did. And you are trying to make the system that tried to kill you better, right? And that, that to me, you all are patriots. You all represent the patriotic spirit that I think gets looked over in America. So that's what I think the church ought to do. I think the church ought to do what Jesus said. We ought to visit the poor. We ought to not just sit with them. We ought to see about how we can help them and be better in their life uh, and, and congratulate those and commend those who though were treated like animals yet act in a civil way and try to help change the system for future generations to make it better. Thank you so much. And I mean, I would just add to that on what I feel the churches can also do um, as it relates to the concept of redemption is yes, visiting people in prisons because that's what the Bible says also, but also when people are returning, we think about ministry, ministry yeah. also is outside of the church, right? It's not just in the church, it carries outside of the church. That's right. You know, so often, even when I was coming home from prison, I came from a different place, but 
The people who visit the prisons cannot usually communicate with people once they leave prison. And so people are looking for communities and church homes to go to. For me, New York Theological Seminary, Abyssinia Baptist Church, and many others were family for me. But many people come home and have nowhere to go. And then they go into churches trying to find a home. And then they're looked at sideways, if you will. They're not embraced and treated in the capacity or given the resources that they need. So, you know, I think that when we think about community, we think about redemption, we think about religious religion or the concept of that, we also have to take that outside of the prisons as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Pastor, for agreeing on that point. <laughs> I think right now, I know um, some additional information that's going in the chat from Allison will be about guidance on what advocates should be seeking in reform and the role of the bail industry in preventing reform in New Orleans. And so I want to just give a shout out to our partners at Hope House NOLA, um, Operation Restoration and the Freedom and Safety Fund led by Montreal Carmouche down there. It's doing incredible work in New Orleans as well. And Robin, um, the film also spotlights California's SB10 um, which is set to reduce the use of cash bail and now on November's ballot for Proposition 25. Can you expand on, expand upon the issue and what reformers should be asking when seeking change? Sure. So, you know, SB 10 is like one of those things that's just a heartbreak, right? It should be a bill that we can all love. Um, it purports to eliminate, you know, the bail bond industry that profits from poverty and desperation. And we know that. And um, there's no industry, you know, I think, in the nation that we'd rather see end uh, tomorrow than the, the bail bond industry. Um, and it would end cash bail, you know, in California. But there are some real problems with the bill. And so reformers and um, folks here in California, there's a big debate about this, about whether we would support it or not support it. And it's a really good example about why we have to be vigilant about even if we end our system of cash bail, if we are not careful about what we create after that, right, we run the risk that we're going to recreate the same harms, the same racial disparities that we had all along. So the problem with this bill is that once it came out of the political process, it really wasn't a bill any longer just aimed at decarceration. Um, and more importantly, it's very clear that the bill is not going to move the needle on racial disparities. Um, and that's because the entire bill, from the start to the finish, its entire structure, every decision-making point along the way about setting cash bail or not setting cash bail, um, is going to rest on one foundation, which are the algorithmic risk assessment tools, which is a really long way of saying that what it does is this new system would mean every person who enters the criminal legal system is going to be assessed for risk by using algorithms that pretend they can predict human behavior. Um, there's a lot of problems with that. Um, I mean, obviously the idea that you can predict human behavior is questionable to begin with, but the bigger problem is the data that's gonna be used to assess a person's risk is historic criminal justice data, right? And that means what does history tell us about people's involvement in the criminal legal system? But what we know about that is that that reflects the over-policing of communities of color and the systemic racism that our criminal legal system has from start to finish and has had for generations. Very much to William's point about his experience in the South Bronx. If you are being, if you are being over-policed in your community, you are gonna be more likely to have had contact with the criminal legal system. That's the data that these risk assessments are going to actually use. So bias in, bias comes out, right? And that's just not my word for it. The experts in the field, you know, data scientists and social scientists all agree that you're not going to be able to pull bias and racism out of the tool. Um, and so if we know that going into it, it's really hard to support a bill that is that the foundation of which is going to be using these tools that we know are going to further and better and perpetuate uh, racial disparities. Um, to make matters worse, it creates a whole new infrastructure in California of, um, you know, entities that are going to surveil and supervise people once they are released. And that function is being placed in the hands very much of law enforcement and probation like entities that are going to just create a bigger law enforcement apparatus to surveil and supervise communities and communities of color who haven't been convicted of a crime. So again, rather than investing in community support for folks who need it, the bill strengthens the culture of law enforcement and is going to create onerous conditions of release that a lot of us fear are very likely going to wind up with people going back to jail, um, not because they've recommitted an offense, but because they 
violate a technical, which as we know in probation and parole, we see all the time, right? You miss an appointment, you go back to jail. You don't pay a fine, you go back to jail. Um, so that this bill really runs that risk. Um, and so as much as I want to support it, because I do think it would lead initially to decarceration and on its face, it ends cash bail and does put a stake in the heart of the bail bond industry. Um, I think it's really complicated and it really boils down to, is this bill good enough? And this moment of time when we're reckoning in this nation with our history of racial injustice, are we willing to support a bill that we know will not move the needle in terms of racial injustice and we know will further embed and perpetuate the kinds of systemic racism that we've seen historically? So it's really, really complicated and really good people, you know, can believe that the bill is a good thing because it will decarcerate more numbers of people. I'm just going to say we need to beware about what the long term effects are and the structures we're creating, because once they're created, dismantling them become almost impossible. Thank you, Robin, so much. I mean, you know, you answered the question it was, what are the issues that people should be looking out for and asking themselves when you're thinking and seeking change? And so often, you know, when we do this work, all of us, you know, we say, you know, one step is a first step, or, you know, we want to make sure we're doing something that's going to help with decarceration. But I think you made such a powerful point that sometimes those efforts um, with well intentioned and not always thought through. And often what we've learned is that it's not it's not thought through well enough because it's not informed by people who have the lived experience, who've been on, who's been on incarcerated because they couldn't afford to pay bail. Um, the things that they need when they come home, they're not asking those questions. And so I think that it is critical as, you know, we all, especially now, we're talking about voting down the ballot. What do we need to do to make these changes that we're taking the opportunity to do our own due diligence do our own research, ask the questions that we need, but make sure that we are voting. Because if we don't vote, that is a vote. And so, you know, I'm so sad because we're closing already. Um, this is such a great conversation. I saw in the chat where someone said, this is the best town hall they've ever been to. So, you know, kudos to everyone here for that. I think that's super dope. That's the first time I've ever heard that. So I'm happy about that. But I'd just like to take the time to thank everyone for joining us. And um, we want to welcome back Allison to the conversation to share some of the audience questions. Thank you all so much for being such a lively and engaged audience. Uh, one question from the audience comes from Bernadette Hartfield from Atlanta, Georgia. She asks, uh, some communities complain about recidivist crime committed by those released on signature. What is the response to the victims of those crimes? Who wants to answer that? I think, uh, okay, Brittany, I see that finger up first, then see Reverend Turner. Go ahead, Brittany. Okay, this is really a good question. I appreciate that because I, I am based out of Dallas, Texas, and we were doing some work with our district attorney, John Cruzo, and he came out with a policy that said, if anybody has had a small theft charge. I think it was up to like $2,500. They were not going to persecute. It may have been a little lower than that. So don't quote me. And people were mad. And I was shocked because it was church people who were mad. And then it got into like an age breakdown where like the boomers, no shade to the boomers, but my mom and them's age were the main ones who were upset. So in talking to them, it turns out that a lot of them are small business owners and they were particularly concerned about how small business owners will be compensated if they, if they were incentive, if people were incentivized to steal, which is, you know, narrative is everything. And so what I say to that, is it Barbara Allison who asked this question or Bernadette? Bernadette, what I say to that Bernadette is you have to be at the table so we can frame the solution in a way that is beneficial to everyone. I personally would not have made sure that we built in a restitution piece into that policy, but after hearing from the boomers and the church folks who came and snatched me and got me together, I understood that the solution had to be stretched out. And so I say that when we come up with policies, these are not total, cookie cutter fit all solutions as different people with different experiences, concerns and perspectives come to the table, we offer a framework that can be tailored to address the situation at that time. Thank you for your question. Pastor uh, Turner? Yes, I, I would like to add um, that in, in regard to the victims, 
Um, I think having people in jail who have not been convicted of a crime does not help the victims. I think having people who are guilty in jail may help, should help the victims, but we don't know if these folks are guilty or not. That's the thing, 76% of people who are in jail have not been convicted. And so I think as we have seen in our criminal justice system, it gets it wrong a lot of times, a whole lot of times. And so it doesn't benefit the victims having the wrong person in jail. It just, it just, it just, that doesn't, you know, if, 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 if that does, then that makes the victim sound sadistic. It just wants to see people suffer, but it doesn't have to be the right person. It just, they just want to see somebody suffer. And, and we've seen that too in America, especially as it relates to, 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 to black men. We, I'm in Tulsa right now, uh, the site of the worst race mask in American history, um, because folks want to see black people suffer, period. They were, they were racist, they were jealous that we had as much success as we did, and they bombed it to the ground. They just want to see us suffer. Um, I don't want to paint that broad stroke on victims. You know, I, I would hope, and I believe, if I, especially if I were a victim, I would want them to get the right person and uphold the constitutional rights, even of the alleged perpetrator. Right? And so that's, that's one side of it. And the second side of it, I think from the list that was just read by Robin, um, what is wrong with creating pretrial systems that are supportive of even the perpetrator, right? So what does that mean? That means that if this victim, if, if this perpetrator is convicted, if he if he or she gets the needed supportive and non-punitive uh, initiatives that they're trying to give to them, they may be less likely to victimize somebody else. You're right. So who, even if I'm the victim, how, how would I be against that? That, that my perpetrator is not getting, say they stole the, a, a flat screen TV from my house. How would I be against my perpetrator, my, my assailant going through pretrial systems that encourage him or her to not steal somebody else's flat screen TV? Like I would want to be, I would be in support of that. So I think that um, we should stop painting victims as just some sadistic group of people that like to see folks suffer because they may have suffered, right? And, and see and see victims as a part of society as a whole that although what happened to them was terrible, they don't want that to happen to anybody else again, right? And to be a part of these solutions um, on that. It's the same thing when black families lose loved ones at the hands of police violence, right? They're the victims. But people immediately tell these black families, well, you need to just forgive and, 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 and get over it. You know, let's come together. You know, they, but they are victims. But they can't even mourn the death of their loved one that was killed by the police because the next day, people say, you need to forgive. I'm on a, I am an AME. So when Mother Emanuel happened, and, and when, I mean, when the Charleston 9 happened, nine folks killed Mother Emanuel, the next day, they were telling folks, at Mother Emanuel, you ought to forgive. You know, you be, do do your Christian duty. These are victims, right? And so black people have been forced to not even enjoy the mourning of their victimhood. Um, and we have never been as sadistic as others and want to see people suffer as we have suffered. And so I think as, as we have learned how to do that, I think the larger society needs to as well. Well, I appreciate everyone's perspective here. And I think, you know, what, I, what I'm hearing is that we need to all think about more just and restorative practices as it relates to healing, period. You know, there's so much trauma that has happened in this country based on the history of this country. And the trauma is perpetuated through all of the violence that we have. We have the systems violence, we have police violence, we have incarceration, we have poverty, we have state violence, we have sexual violence, we have all these violence and traumas that people are facing in this country. And unless we all take a look at ourselves and how we are actually also perpetuating violence, um, we're gonna continue to have this cycle, the cycle of abuse that's happening within this country. And so, you know, I'd like to encourage people even to stop categorizing people, right? Violence, nonviolence, victim, perpetrator. Like all of this is language that is, it's harming for all of us. 
I think people are people. I think, you know, when you're healed, you heal. When you're harmed, you harm. And I think, you know, when we think about these systems that harm, we have to do things that are dismantling the systems. I think the Bail Project has done that. I think community-based organizations are doing that. I think that, you know, Black Mama's Bailout has done that. I think that there's so much that's going on in this country um, and there are, there are solutions. So I think that we all have to plug in to where, I think the, the point was raised earlier, plug in where we are most passionate about, where we are most spirit felt and where we wanna have the most impact and do that because we all can't do everything, but we all can do something. So I just wanna take a moment and thank everyone because we are at the end. I'm supposed to be like, we're nearing the end. No, we are at the end in the close of this town hall. But just to remind everyone, this entire event has been recorded because I see a lot of that asking in the chat and will be available on Odyssey Impact's website and YouTube page. Anyone who's registered will receive a link by email when the recording has been prepared and please feel free to share it with all of your networks. If you enjoyed today's discussion, we encourage you to consider hosting a virtual screening of Tracked Cash Bail in America with your community, organization or house of worship. All screenings, all screening hosts will have access to the film's accompanying resources, which includes a facilitator and discussion guide. Please see the chat for screening registration information. On behalf of Odyssey Impact and EMI, an enormous thank you to our esteemed panelists and to the community for joining us. The panelists, you all have been incredibly knowledgeable. I've learned so much in this conversation and the work that you're doing every day is changing lives in this country. So I just wanna take a personal moment to thank each and every one of you for what you've added and brought to this conversation. So again, on behalf of myself, Odyssey Impact, and the entire panel, we thank you for joining us today. God bless you and make sure you vote.